Hello and welcome to lecture 73 of my class from data to decisions. And in this lecture, we're going to do some design of experiments work using response surface modeling in R. So I have a, uh, an R code that's, of course, like always, available on the course website for you to download and follow along. And we're going to install and use the package RSM. As we'll see, uh, the modeling that we're going to do is simple linear uh, least squares kind of modeling. So we can use the LM routine, just like we've always done when doing ordinary least squares regression. But the RSM package, which does that kind of modeling, has a few other extra features that are specific to response surface modeling and can be useful. Uh, but just remember, from the modeling perspective, just doing plain old LM linear regression works just as well. All right, so I've already installed the package RSM, so I'll simply load the library. And one of the things that this package has is the design of experiments. So we can run, tell it what kind of a design we want, and it will create those designs. For example, there's a function called BBD, which generates a box Benkin design. You give it the number of factors, three, uh, the number of center points, um, and then uh, for a box, and give it the coding of the variables. Here I have three variables, uh, force rate and polish. So this is a polishing process where uh, I have the rate at which um, I'm, I'm rotating a, a polish. Uh, the grit of the polish itself is the polish variable, and then the force that I'm using to press down. So I tell it x1, x2, and x3 in terms of force rate and polish with a mean of 20 and a half range of 3, for example, for the force. Look up the uh, help on, on this function to get more details. And when I run it, it tells me what the design is. All right, so it has the uh, run order, the standard order. Uh, in other words, it's, it's already randomized for us. And it tells us the force rate and the polish. To, to meet those, and the data are in these coded forms, x1, x2, and x3. All right, so uh, other these routines will allow you to generate these designs uh, painlessly. What we're going to do is take an example where we've already run a particular uh, experiment, and we're going to do the modeling work. Uh, in this case, say chem react data set in the RSM as a package as an example. So we'll just simply load that data set. And if I go look at it to see what it has, it has time and temperature of a reaction and then the yield and percentage. It was run in two different blocks, block one and block two. If I look carefully, I see that um, block one is nothing but a two-factor full factorial design, and uh, the center point here at 85 and 175 time and temperature run one, two, three times. So I have uh, a full factorial design with three repeats of the center point. Then I add some uh, star points, some axial points. I circumscribed uh, circumference design. And they were run in a second block. In other words, uh, this is very common. You, you start by doing a full factorial design. And then if you see that you're in the right space, you might add the star points, these axial points, to turn it into a second order design that allows you to do response surface modeling. And that is what is done here. And so we have these two different blocks, B1 and B2. All right. If I plot the data, we'll see that in a little bit more clear form. Uh, so a time, temperature, block, and yield are, are the data. And if I look at time versus temperature, I get to see the design, right? So I have four corners here, here, and here. There's my full factorial design with the center points. And then I have these axial star points added to the design. Uh, so time versus temperature gives us the design itself. Uh, the block is, as you know, is, is, as I said, was a first block for the full factorial and a second block for the axial designs. Uh, looking at 
time versus yield and temperature versus yield. It's hard to really get a whole lot out of this. But if I look at block versus yield, I'll notice something pretty interesting. So the first block, block one, has all of these yield points. And block two over here, all of these yield points. Notice how much they, they shift, they change uh, between blocks. And it's this block effect that's going to make um, life a little bit interesting. Uh, but we can deal with that seamlessly using the proper response surface modeling approach. All right. So we've got our data. And if I look at the data, you see it's got time and temperature. Through the model, we want to first standardize our variables, you know, uh, subtract off the mean and divide by half the range so that our variables time and temperature go from minus one to plus one each. And there's a coded dot data routine here that does that automatically. So it converts time and temperature to X1 and X2 and creates a new data set called CR, coded uh, reaction, chem reaction rate. So let me run that. And if I look at the data, I see that's now X1, X2 block and yield. And of course, X1 and X2 go from minus one to one, zero being zero, zero being the center point. Uh, interestingly, if you look at how the center point changes, right? In, in block one, my center points are you know, 83, 84, 84 kind of yields. When I go to block two, those same center points give me uh, about 79.8, 79.5, right? So we get about a four, four and a half percent drop in yield from one block to the next under nominally identical conditions. Right? So the blocking is, is turning out to be a very important aspect of this design. All right, let's go and do some modeling. As I said, we could do um, modeling using the LM function, but instead I'm going to use the RSM function here. And let's do it as if uh, the data were collected in two sets. So the first set is the full factorial design. It's block one. Uh, normally we would collect that data and we go and analyze it initially before we do anything else. So let's assume that that's what we're doing. I'm going to use the RSM routine and I will do yield as a function of, and in this case it's got a little function called FO. That means first order. So I'm saying, give me a first order model in X1 and X2. In this case, FO uh, is defined to be only the main effects, no interaction terms. Then I'll tell it I want a subset only block one, because I'm essentially pretending that we've only done the first part of the experiment. We've only collected the block one data. All right, so I will run that model. It will send it into this variable. Uh, which I'll then summarize here with summary. So if I go look, uh, here's the formula, and I have an intercept and coefficients of x1 and x2. If I look carefully, though, I see that neither one of these coefficients are statistically significant. It seems like x1 and x2 are not affecting. Right? There'll be an explanation for why those aren't affecting the yield. Um, but we'll get to that in just a minute. All right, we can look at our uh, analysis of variance table. But the other thing that, that this routine does that's different than LM is it actually looks at the direction of steepest descent and then and tells you how much you should shift uh, the, the variable to move towards the optimum, right? So it says uh, it's recommending we increment time by four minutes and temperature by 2.9 All right, let's look at our data real quick. Notice that temperature midpoint here is 175. If I vary it by three degrees, that's moving the midpoint over here to 178. That's not very much. That's still within the region of my full factorial experimental design. Likewise, the time goes from 78 to 92. So if I move the center point from uh, 85 and I add 4 to 89, it is also still within my uh, full factorial design. So it's recommending a move that is less than the data I already have. 
that's an indication that I don't need to move. That, in fact, I can find the optimum by just by adding the star points to the existing design. And once you get your full factorial design in the right place, then that's what you do. You don't have to recollect all that same data. You can add as a second block the, the, the star points. And that's what we're going to do. All right. Another thing we could do is add the interaction terms. Uh, you can do that in a couple of ways. One is we can use this update routine that takes the existing model and updates it by adding the, uh, the interaction terms. And the TWI means the uh, interaction terms. Or I could just run the whole thing over again and say yield is a function of the first order plus the interaction between two x1 and x1 two terms. All right, I won't bother running it. If we run that, we still get parameters that are not significant. Why aren't these parameters significant? Aren't temperature and time actually doing something? Well, they are, but think about a parabola. See, uh, we're trying to model second order behavior with a first order model. That's what it's going to turn out to be. You can't really tell all you have done is the first order model. Uh, here we're just going to see that there's not a whole lot of uh, variation with time and temperature. But now let's add the star points to our design, collect the data, and model using a second order model. All right, so now I will do the same RSM. I'll have yield as a function of the second order, x1 and x2. That includes the first order terms and their interactions. And I'll include block as a variable because the difference between block one and block two will turn out to be important. And I'm not using a subset here because I'm, I'm using all of the blocks. So I run that model and summarize the data. Now I go look at my model and I see that there's x1, there's x2, the interaction of x1 and x2, x1 squared, x2 squared. And I see that everything is significant except the interaction term. Well, before that, the, the linear terms were not significant, and now when I've added second-order terms, the linear terms become statistically significant. And the reason is, is, is we've got the optimum, the peak uh, yield within our experimental design, and so you need those second-order terms to capture those effects. See, our R squared is very high, and it even gives you a stationary point. It says the optimum is at a time of, of 86.9 and a temperature of 176.7. Well, we can actually plot contours of the model fit. And if I that and take a look, see yield hits a maximum here. And again, these are model terms, uh, but they're contours of, of time and temperature. Uh, notice that the kind of the oblongness of this these uh, these contours are not tilted at all. So time and temperature seem to be uh, independent of each other, which is why that interaction term didn't have a statistically significant uh, value. All right. Well, that's a very quick introduction to response surface modeling using the RSM package. There are other packages available. Uh, that do similar things and, and other features involved in this and other packages as well. I'll let you explore them on your own. Thanks.